the knee kick. 2-1, fly ball, left center field, Otani obliterated! That man is just built different, halfway up the pavilion in left center. How he turns on the first pitch of the sixth inning, Otani's done it again! Second of the game. Shohei Otani almost single-handedly beating the Royals yesterday. Two home runs, and uh, the Dodgers hit three home runs, but the Royals can't get anything going offensively as Tyler Glass now was outstanding. He's going seven innings, struck out nine Royals, allowed just three hits. As the Royals lose to the Dodgers yesterday, three to nothing. They go uh, one and two against the Dodgers in that three-game weekend series. Welcome to Sports Ticket, brought to you by Cuber Brothers Automotive, your home for fast-friendly auto repair. Um, here's Matt Cotrero, the manager of the Royals, on glass now. Yeah, I mean, the whole key to him is how many strikes he threw. I mean, sometimes he can scatter the ball around a little bit, you know, around the zone. Today, he threw a super high percentage of strikes, and when he does that, he's going to be really tough. Royals are 41-32 and 32 now on the season. They have today off. They'll stay on the West Coast, start a three-game set with the 26-48 and 48 A's in Oakland tomorrow night. Uh, the Royals just played 12 straight games against first-place teams. They played two games against Cleveland. They split with Cleveland because it was just a two-game series because there was a rain out. Uh, they won two out of three against Seattle at home, who's in first place in AL West. They lost the first three against the Yankees who lead the American League East, and they won their fourth game to, to avoid being swept, which was pretty exciting stuff in the ninth inning. And then they lost two out of three to the Dodgers, and MJ Melendez with a big grand slam after a 12-pitch at bat allowed them to win at least one out of three. So they went through the gauntlet. They put Cleveland, Seattle, the Yankees, Dodgers, four straight series against four first-place teams, and the Royals went five and seven. And you certainly could argue that they could have easily been 6-6 six and six in that situation. That's okay. It's not great, but it's not bad. They're competitive against the best teams. That's good. And so now the good news is, the good news is that the Royals this year have done pretty well against teams that are bad. Uh, the Royals are slated to play 41 of the next 54 games against teams that are currently below 500. They have six games against the White Sox, who have the worst record in baseball, three games against the Rockies, who have the worst record in National League, three games against the Marlins, who have the second worst record in the National League, and three games against the A's starting tomorrow night, who have the second worst record in the American League. So they have 15 games against the four worst teams in baseball, 41 of the next 54 against teams that are currently below 500. Okay. If they can keep doing yeah. what they did early in the year, beating the bad teams, then they will be just fine. And right now they're forty-one and thirty-two on the season. I was talking about this last week. Uh, you know, in some of the days that you were gone, I had been kind of warning people that that tough stretch was coming up, right? Mm-hmm. And but I did say it's like the the positive about what the Royals are doing this year is uh, con- contrary to some years when they're you know average, maybe at best. This year they're winning the games and the series that they're supposed to win. It was like you're not going to win every single one of those games, but if you take two out of three, three out of four, or you get a sweep here and there, you're in the right spot. And the Royals are absolutely in the right spot right now. Mm-hmm. Um, even if, even though they went five and seven in these last twelve against really really good teams, because we knew that was coming, right? And so now it is. It's about regrouping. It's about getting back to what you were, you've been doing all year, beating the teams and winning the series that you need to win. And if you do that, then you're sitting in a, in a perfect spot. You're right where you want to be as you move into you know July and then head into August as well. Absolutely. And by the way, Mindy King is pretty excited from Olathe. She was the Sonic Slam recipient of Melinda's Grand Slam, the Sonic Slam ending. Nice. 25000 bucks in her pocket. That doesn't happen very often, no, but it, it did doesn't. happen the other day. <laughs> um, and then bad news in this game, Mookie Betts, I think, is one of the good guys in mm-hmm. professional sports. He, a perennial all-star, having an MVP-type season, shortstop. He's played some outfield as well in his career. Suffered a fractured left hand. Uh, got hit by a pitch yesterday against the Royals, and he will be out for an extended period of time. They're saying that he will not need surgery. Hit by a 98-mile-an-hour fastball. That'll do it. That'll do yeah. it. Uh, College World Series is underway in Omaha. Top seed Tennessee, who had the crazy comeback to win the first game up there against Florida State. They improved to 2-0, a 6-1 win over North Carolina in bracket one. Of course, Hayes highs uh, Dylan Dryling had the game-winning hit in that first game for Tennessee. Virginia was the first team eliminated, and that was the team that knocked out K-State in the Super Regional. Uh, they lose Florida State 7-3. Two games in bracket two today. Elimination game, NC State faces Florida at 1 o'clock. In the winner's bracket, Kentucky takes on Texas A&M at 6 o'clock in Omaha. In uh, hockey, the Stanley Cup Finals still going on thanks to a route. Nagel a pinched in and didn't get it. Here's Fogel with Holloway. They're out for blood. Holloway had it blocked. Then they score on the follow-up. Ryan McLeod. 8-1 Edmonton. 
You know, if Edmonton could have spread out a few of those goals early in the series, that might have been a little bit more helpful for them. But they get the delightful win, 8-1 to over the Panthers on Saturday. And tomorrow night, Florida has a chance to close it out for the first Stanley Cup championship for the Florida Panthers. Game 5 tomorrow night in Florida. Florida leads that best of seven. Three games to one. In the NBA Finals, the Mavericks crushed the Celtics game four on Friday. Celtics looked like they didn't care and wanted to finish it in Boston. Uh, Luka Doncic had 29 in that one. And uh, like the Stanley Cup Finals, which looked like it was headed towards a sweep, instead will be a game five. It's tonight in Boston. Celtics try to close out their first championship since 08 when they had Garnett, Allen, and Pierce. And it would be their 18th title. And that would be the most in NBA history, breaking a tie with the L.A. Lakers. 7.30 tonight on ABC. Listen, uh, my, my prediction still is intact. Mm-hmm. I said the Mavs in seven. All they got to do is win the next three. First team to ever come back from 3-0 in the NBA playoffs or NBA finals. And they will have won in seven and be the NBA champions. And I must say, I, I was inspired yesterday. Uh, we got back from our vacation. I was at the Wellness Center yesterday. And uh, they had a 30 for 30 on one of the TVs of the Red Sox. Mm-hmm. Down three games to none. And, you know, I remember certain things about that comeback. But it is crazy how close the Red Sox were to being swept and how close they were to losing in Game 5. I mean, mm-hmm. you talk, and it all happened in, in a span of 24 hours. Actually, one game finished the same day the other one, Game yeah. 5, took place because they didn't finish till 1 in the morning. And you're sitting here, and David Ortiz had the game-winning homer, and they had the game-winning base hit the, the, later in the day in game, uh, game 5 to send it back to New York. And I remember all the people said it was over, and I was thinking, well, it's probably over. But when the Red Sox did win Game 4, I thought, you know, if they could win Game 5... All the pressure's on the Yankees. Yeah. And then they won game five, and, and then game six, they were able to, to, to pull one out. And then they just absolutely annihilated the Yankees game seven. Uh, and the Yankees, you know, you could, they, all the pressure was on the Yankees at that point. And the Red Sox had this, all this momentum. Then they swept the World Series. So every great comeback has to start somewhere, mm-hmm. is my point. The Red Sox needed, you know, uh, Kevin Millar to walk against Mariano Rivera, and then Dave Roberts come in and steal, and everybody in the world knew he was going to steal, and he still stole second base, and then they got a base hit, and boom, they, they, a blown save for Mariano Rivera, which hardly ever happened mm-hmm. in his history in postseason play. And they staved off elimination, won it later in extra innings on the Ortiz walk-off. Every comeback has to start somewhere. You know, I, I didn't predict that one. Nobody did. Back in '04, but in two, uh, in 2016, when the Warriors were up three games to one, I predicted on this show, and I was told I was crazy by multiple people, and I was proven to be right. And I said, "Listen, you better not let the Cavaliers win Game Five. You let the Cavaliers win Game Five. Now, now, you got LeBron. The Cavs got momentum. The, the Warriors got to get Draymond Green back acclimated because he got suspended for a game. And I said, if you get into a Game Seven, and I said this." And I remember people like, uh, well, that part makes sense. If it gets to a game seven, you go with the best player in the world. And Steph Curry's a great player, but at the time, LeBron was the greatest player in the world. And there's no doubt at Mm -hmm. that time. And LeBron just absolutely came through with flying colors. and was amazing. Irving hit the big shot. And I was told, you're crazy because the Warriors hadn't lost. I think they lost three games all year at home. It's like, they're not going to lose two straight games at home and, or this and that. I'm like, I don't care. if you Don't let it get to a game seven. And Kevin, uh, Kevin Millar was the one that said on the Red Sox when they were down 3-0. And it's, it, it, it gets me goosebumps, and I'm not a Red Sox fan. Yankee fans have to hate it. But he, he was the key catalyst with the, the mentality. They were oh, yeah. called a bunch of idiots, is what they called them. They're just a bunch of idiots. And he said, he just was loose as a goose, and he's, they're down 3-0, and they're in Boston, and all the Red Sox fans are like, ah, you know, the Yankees beat us again. They have our number. The curse of the Bambino lives on. And Kevin Millar says, you better not. And he said it to the cameras. It was on ESPN and everything else. He said, all the reporters, he said, listen, you better not let us win today. Because you let us win today, we've got we got Petey, Pedro Martinez in Game 5, we got Kurt Schilling in Game 6, and, and Schilling's performance in Game 6 was amazing, mm-hmm. by the way, uh, on basically a messed up ankle. They just had surgery on, torn tendon, the bloody sock. Mm-hmm. And, and then, of course, they won Game 7. They got all the momentum. And Kevin Millar was just like, you better not let us win Game 4. And they did. Okay, so the Celtics, and this is the thing I was talking to my son about the other day. He said, well, Boston just wants to win it at home, and they didn't show up for game four. I said, that happens, and they very well will. They mm-hmm. More than likely, will finish it out tonight. More than likely, they'll finish it out tonight. But here's the thing I said to my son. I said, the Celtics better not screw around and lose tonight. They better not lose game five. And you'd be sitting here going, well, what, what's the big deal? Like, they lose game five, they still have two games, and they still have one at home. 
It's the same exact situation as the Warriors and the Cavaliers. You better not let the Mavericks win tonight if you're a Boston Celtic fan. Because if the Mavericks win tonight in Boston, now they've got the momentum. Secondly, they have figured something out if they won two games in a row. Boston this year has been good at home and about everywhere in the postseason. Mm -hmm. But the Celtics in the last few years have not been good at home. They have not closed out games at home. They've lost series at home on their home home court. The, the, the Bucks, I think, one year lost on Game Seven at home, if I remember correctly. The Celtics did to the Bucks. So there's no guarantee the Celtics can win the series. Everybody's like, "Well, there's guarantee because they've nobody's ever blown a three zero lead." Well, that's what they said about the Yankees. And then if there was ever a time, listen, if there was ever a time to believe there was no way in hell anybody was coming back for an 0-3 deficit, it was that rivalry. Mm. There was nothing in the history of the Red Sox-Yankees that told you there was any way possible. Even if the Red Sox win the next three, eh, the Yankees are just going to break their heart like they always did. If that can happen, don't sit here and be dumb enough to not believe that the Mavs can't, can't come back from 0-3. Am I predicting it? I don't know if I'm going that far yet. I'm thinking about it. But I will stick with my prediction. I said the Mavs in seven. Why should I change? It's still possible. I look like an idiot if I jump off my own wagon and then the Mavs end up winning it in seven. What I'm saying is the Celtics better not goof off like they did the other night. They better be ready to go tonight. The Celtics need to treat game five as game seven. Okay? And I think they will come out and try to do that. And I do believe the Celtics will probably win tonight. The law of averages make it that way. Uh, but at the same time, if the Celtics do not finish this tonight, if they don't win it tonight, Mavs in seven. I'm even I'm more confident about it because the Mavs going to go back to Dallas in game six. All the pressures on the Celtics because this is what will happen if the Celtics lose tonight. Boston fans will get nervous, and then they go, "Oh my God, is this karma?" Yeah. We, we, we were this close to getting our 18th NBA championship, and now we may, oh my God, we're up 3-2, but we, we, we lost at home, so Game seven's no guarantee. And what did I say before this series? If the games end up being close at the very end of the game, if we've got about a minute or two left, and it's a, a, a one or two possession game, who do you favor? And you agreed with me. Kyrie Irving, Luka Doncic, best closers in the NBA right now. Not Tatum, not Brown. The Celtics have won comfortably or had a nice big lead to where they held on in the one yeah, game. They won by yeah. seven. They had a big 12, 14 point lead, got down to like seven or six, whatever. But, you know, they, they had it in control. I'm, we not, have not a high pressure fourth no, quarter the entire time. We have, we, yeah. have not, we have not had a game in this series no. where it's gone down to the final 60 seconds and it's anybody's game. Okay, we have not had a chance to see Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic's close. And I said this uh, before I went on vacation that Kyrie's not going to keep playing that poorly, and he didn't. He played great. Uh, actually, played very good the last game. Of course, Luka played great the game before that. He played great when they lost mm-hmm. Game Three. Okay, so I'm sitting here for the most part thinking Mavs. If this game's tight in the final minute, I'm taking the Mavs. Mavs win tonight. Now all of a sudden, oh dear Lord. The people in Boston are going to start freaking out, even though they lead three games to two. Because if you allow this to go to a game seven, I'm betting on the guys that are clo- or better closers. I, a game seven, and you get down the final minute or two, who do you think the pressure's on? It's on everybody, but it's really on Boston. And it's on Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. And I'm going to tell you right now, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are great players, but they have not been in a situation where... You know, they were up 2-1 on the Warriors, couldn't close it out, had a few chances to win, you know, win a third game of that series, did mm-hmm. not. And Steph Curry came through and saved their bacon in game four of that series and tied it in Boston. Great players come up big in huge mm-hmm. games. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, we're going to find out. If they are, if one of those guys is, you know, the next superstar of this league, some people think Tatum is already, I'm not, that, I'm not willing to go that far yet. I want to see him close it. So if you're the Celtics, you close it tonight. If you're such this great team, you close it tonight. Somebody threw out the word dynasty the other day. I'm like, that is one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. You have to win like at least a couple in a row or three out of four. <laughs> like, how is one season a dynasty? The Warriors had a dynasty, 73 and 9, yeah. and then they lost in seven to the Cavs. So if you're the Celtics, don't lose tonight. Because you lose tonight, now we're sitting here going, are they starting to choke? 
Are they going to get tight? And I've seen the Celtics get tight the last few years. And I've seen Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum start to go one-on-one and play hero ball, just like OKC did up three games to one against the Golden State Warriors with Russ Brook and Durant. And they went away from it, got them up 3-1. They went to hero ball, one-on-one instead of involving the teammates. And they lost three straight, lost in seven. If the Celtics revert back to what they are capable of doing, and that is being lethargic on offense, not moving the ball, Tatum and Brown think that they're going to be the hero, then the Celtics might have an issue. So tonight, to me, is a game seven. The Celtics need to close it. If you're Dallas, obviously, your backs are against the wall. Once again, role players play better at home than on the road. So that is advantage Boston tonight. But Boston Celtics, let me tell you right now, you lose tonight, you have some problems, even though you're up 3-2 in the series. And maybe the Mavs have figured something out. Well, yeah, and... Yeah, I still think a, a huge difference in this series is when Porzingis goes down and can't play too. Yeah, and I right. think they probably have figured out. You know, it, it took him. They didn't know if he was going to play in Game Three because they, right. they didn't know exactly how to game plan. But they were probably planning on him not being out there based on the reports. But he was not out there, obviously, for Game Four. I saw none of Game Four. Uh, didn't miss anything. It doesn't look like so. Uh, we're good there. But uh, yeah, I, I I'm with you on tonight for sure they the the celtics just need to come out here and and i don't think there's going to be any issue with them being locked in tonight i think they'll be ready to go and locked in but the celtics play a, a type of ball that if the shots aren't falling they shoot a lot it of doesn't threes. matter how locked in you are right they shoot like a lot if, of threes. If your shots aren't going down then that's going to change a lot of of the success level that you have right mm-hmm. you can be as focused and zoned in as you want on one end of the floor and playing it really well over there. And if you're shot, but they, again, they're also a team that's not going to stop shooting either. Yeah. And, and eventually they start going down typically for the Celtics. And so obviously game four, like I said, I didn't see it. I don't know how that went. Obviously the shots weren't falling if you lost by 38. But, well, game four, they just kept blowing out the just, building. Yeah. You're down early and it was just like, yeah, this is, let's just, let's just go ahead and move on with this. That is the vibe that I was getting just based on looking at the updates on the scores and stuff. So, it's uh but yeah, I agree with you. I mean you gotta come out tonight and act like this is game seven. Just lock it up, finish it up tonight. Um I it's it's so hard, obviously because this is a bit different scenario than some of those three ones that we're talking about because the Mavericks had to do it from 3-0. And so it's so hard. I think it, it's a lot like that comeback they made in game three, right? You're, you're fighting all the way back mm-hmm. here. You get within one, and then you you don't, just don't have enough to finish it. They were leaving a couple shots short, and then Celtics made some plays to, to get it done. So um, obviously, I, I know where you're coming from. If the Celtics don't win tonight and it does go to 3-2, then the pressure does go to Boston. There's no doubt about that. Um I, I think Boston does typically play well on the road, notwithstanding Game Four, obviously the way that went. So uh, you know, I think that they will have a, a better focus than maybe some teams would going on the road for that Game Six, and, and maybe be able to close it out there. Um, but yeah, it's, tonight just go into the mentality or with the mentality of this is Game Seven, just finish it off. Don't let's not even let them dream that they're going to have a chance to win this series. That's what I'm saying. You yeah. you stomp them when you stomp them. Absolutely. You cannot let a team hang around. Ask the Yankees. That's my point. Yeah. Ask the Yankees. Ask the 16 Warriors. Ask the 85 Blue Jays. Ask the 85 St. Louis Cardinals against the Royals up yeah. 3-1 and 3-1. You let somebody hang around. You play loose for a game. And then suddenly momentum can change. And I thought Boston in Game Four just was like, "We're going to win it at home anyway. That's where we want to win it." And maybe that's maybe that they're that good, but without Porzingis, they don't have as much room for air. They're still the the deeper, more talented team than the Mavericks, even without Porzingis. Yeah. But Charles Barkley said a few weeks ago. He said without Porzingis, he goes, "I think they need Porzingis to win a championship." Now, I don't think he's going to play the rest of the series, and if he, and, and, like and that does make the Celtics a, a little bit easier to defend. And the Celtics, they they had a game recently at home that when they when they won one hundred five ninety eight, they were ten of thirty nine from three. So they go ten of thirty nine from three tonight. I don't think they win. They got to no, shoot better than that. Yeah. And so they do rely on the three ball sometimes. They get happy to content to take the, the long shots. They get into one on one situations when things get a little bit stagnant. And so, uh, yeah, Celtics to me need to win it tonight. If they don't win it tonight, then we've got a heck of a series now. And so, did you pray the Celtics in five or six? 
I picked yeah. six. I've okay. I've wanted to honestly the last two series to pick the Celtics in five, but mm-hmm. I'm like I'm giving credit to their opponents, mm-hmm. and I didn't obviously know what the status of Porzingis was going into the finals. I, if if I'd have known he was playing, I'd have said five. Um, but now he's out, and so it's now it's just like kind of weird uh, with my prediction anyway of where I would have put that at. But I did pick him in six, uh, but. You know, I you know give a little credit to Dallas because I thought maybe they could cause some problems. But I'm going to tell you right now that uh, you talk about you know it 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 hurts the Celtics a little offensively with what they can do. It hurts them tremendously defensively because the Mavericks have they have more confidence, obviously playing in the lane without Kristaps Porzingis protecting the rim, mm-hmm. and that opens up a lot more. You know, I mean, it was unreal that like the first game and a half of how he was affecting the rim and affecting what they wanted to do inside and in the, even just the drivers the guard shooting and, and and all that stuff and trying to get to the rim it was so difficult the first game or game and a half and then he had the injury and then now that's that's not really a, a big factor in it because they don't have anybody else now Horford ain't doing that so they don't have anybody else that's protecting the rim like that so that opens up a lot offensively for the Mavericks too if they do it the right way two things to keep an eye on in this series one is Porzingis will he be able to play he has clearance from the medical staff to play if the situation begs for him which means I guess they get desperate they're going to play him mm-hmm. um that's not really great uh but if he could that changes things certainly if he can be effective the other thing too is and don't overlook this tim hardaway jr is a very talented player but he has not he struggled this year worked his way out of the player rotation and garbage time and this is the danger when you just sit around and let somebody win and i'm not saying celtics let him win necessarily but they didn't bring the effort mm-hmm. and and the mavericks cruise but they also got tim hardaway jr play a lot and he hit five out of seven from three and he's been struggling shooting the ball all of a sudden that, and that guy can light it up i've seen him do it in his yeah. career now all of a sudden you got a guy that starts hitting it from outside and gives another scoring option besides luca and kyrie so Tim Hardaway maybe gets some more minutes tonight and could be a big part of the recipe for the Mavericks winning in Boston and forcing a game six. So mm-hmm. I'll stick with it. I'll, I'll Mavericks in seven. I'll stick with it. First team to ever come back from 3-0. That was not my prediction before the series, obviously. <laughs> uh, but every comeback from a deficit in a series has to begin somewhere. And maybe it began the other night, or it's just going to be a Boston tea party uh, tonight. They're going to, you know, I'm sure they're going to drink tea, but they're just going to have a great time and they're going to blow out the Mavericks, win easily, and they'll be holding their 18th NBA Finals trophy in their team history, which is a record in the NBA. And that very well could happen tonight. I don't think the Mavericks are like the Wolves, where they're just happy they didn't get swept. I would be extremely, I'd be extremely disappointed. And Dallas Mavericks, if they go out and do what the T Wolves did against the Mavericks uh, when they were down, no. And, and listen, I think one of the big things is like in, in anything like this is if you've got a dude that has been there and done this, Kyrie's done it. Kyrie has done it. Whether he was the main guy or not, he's been there and done this and had an outstanding NBA Finals series when they came back from three to one to beat the Warriors that people don't talk about because all they want to talk about is the greatest well, Kyrie, player of all time in their eyes and LeBron James. Man had forty one points yes. in one, and, and I think Game Six. So did LeBron. Yes, to force the seventh game. Yes. If I remember right, that was Game Six. I think right. that they both scored forty one. Yeah, and it's like and Kyrie dude, had the shot to be over Curry. That was the game winning shot. Yeah, and LeBron had the game saving block. Absolutely, and so but you know. It, history wants to talk about LeBron in that series and it's like this man's been there and done this whether you like it or not and he has I think the attention of young guys in that locker room of of hey this is what it takes I've been here I've done it maybe maybe things didn't go well for me in a couple of other stops but I know what it takes here and what you got to do to win here and that the Timberwolves didn't have anything like that right I mean they had guys with playoff experience but not like that and so I don't think Kyrie's just going to start going back to Boston tonight I I don't think he's going to be like allowing that team I would hope not to slack off at all. And Kyrie's also eight years older than he was when they. He is, and and so he can't do the same no. things he did then. But no. he can bring yeah. that leadership, and when he's when he's in his right headspace, that man is a an asset and a value for any team. I'll say it again on paper. Celtics before the series, you should have picked them on paper, um, and I'll say it going into tonight on paper. Celtics should win. The Celtics should finish it tonight. They really, truly should. But that doesn't mean they will. So that should be interesting. In 30 seconds, a crazy U.S. Open yesterday. 
I'm Elijah at Kiever Brothers Automotive in Beloit. Did you know that we sell tires? We also perform alignments and all the other services that go along with them. We handle all the top brands. Extras like road hazard warranty, complimentary tire rotations, and complimentary tire repairs are available for purchase on most tires. Right now, we are offering $80 off when you buy a set of four. Call or stop by Kiever Brothers Automotive for fast, friendly tire services today. Find us just south of the courthouse in Beloit or on the web at KieverBrothers.com. For his second U.S. Open victory. Another epic up and down at Pinehurst for a U.S. Open championship. Bryson DeChambeau now has two. Bryson DeChambeau wins the U.S. Open. And it's interesting, you have some of these golf tournaments over the years. And you say to yourself, did Bryson DeChambeau win the U.S. Open or did Roy McIlroy <laughs> lose it? And I always say it's I, my answer to it every single time I hear this question on any sporting event. Mm-hmm. I say it's a combination of both. Yeah. Like an unbelievable comeback. You know, did that team choke or did the other team? Do you give credit to the team that came back or do you give credit to the, or do you blame the team that choked? And I always say it's a combination. And to me, this is a combination. Bryson DeChambeau with yesterday wins by one st- uh, one stroke, um, second major win uh, as well. And Roy McIlroy missed two short par putts within the final three holes of the final round yesterday. He had gone in the hole sixteen with a one stroke lead. hadn't won a major since fourteen, so a decade. DeChambeau was in a tough spot on the final hole. He was in a bunker, hit a chip shot from 55 yards away, less than four feet from the hole, made his par putt to finish 600 for the tournament, one stroke better than McElroy. Here is DeChambeau on his crazy bunker shot and the putt to seal the win. I am so happy I got that shot up and down on 18. (laughs) Oh, man. I didn't want to finish second again. PGA really stung. Xander played magnificent. I wanted to get this one done. That bunker shot was the shot of my life. And uh, I, I don't know what to think. It fully hasn't sunk in yet. And I really wanted this one. I turned the corner and saw I was a couple back and I said, nope, I'm not going to let that happen. I need to focus on figuring out how to make this make this happen. And um, I was a little lucky. Rory didn't uh, make a couple putts that he could have coming in. And I had an amazing up and down in the last. I don't know what else to say. It's, um, it's a dream come true. So DeChambeau came up clutch when he needed it on the final hole. Roy McIlroy did not. More on that in a moment. DeChambeau... It was the 1,000th event hosted by the USGA, and his win of the 2024 U.S. Open pulled him alongside the likes of Walter Hagen, Lee Trevino, Brooks Kepka with two U.S. Open victories. Solidifies the 30-year-old American as one of the best active players in the world, and it's also a crowning achievement for what has been a successful major season. He was runner-up at the PGA, as he alluded to, the Xander Slafley. He tied for six at the Masters. He's done that over the last two months and then won the U.S. Open yesterday. Now for Roy McIlroy. Roy missed from two feet six inches on the 16th hole, returning to a six under tie. He was up one at the time. Uh, the remain nodded until the par four 18th when McElroy pitched his third shot to just inside four feet. However, just that he did two holes earlier, McElroy missed a makeable putt in agonizing fashion. So the question, of course, is how does Roy possibly recover from his latest major heartbreak? And this one's got to be the toughest of them all. He was cruising through the front nine. He hit nitros around the turn, four birdies from nine through 13 to reach eight under, opened up a two-stroke lead with five to play. And then off the tee on 15, he had an issue there. And then, of course, the two short putts that he could knock down in 16 and 18, prolonging his decade-long major drought. Here's an interesting nugget. Roy McIlroy had made all 496 of his putts inside three feet this mm-hmm. season before he missed on the par four 16th. And then he missed the short one on 18 as well. Um, that's called pressure. Pressure will do some weird things to you. Um, only one major left with the U.S. Open finished. That is the British Open, slated for later this summer, July 18th through the 21st. Now, there are a lot of people making fun of Roy McIlroy today. Social media has had a lot of fun with it. Um, and I, you know, part of me, I, I laugh. It's kind of funny. At the same time, I try to, I try to relate. And I, I, I will say this. I... I did not play collegiate sports. Well, I did play collegiate sports. I played tennis in college. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I played high school sports, a lot of different high school sports. I had my, I had my uh, moments of, of, of exhilaration and success. I had my moments of failure and adversity. And 
And then even as I get older as a coach of even youth sports, it's like, you know, you lose. I, I still it still pisses me off and upsets me that we lost a one to nothing baseball game at the state Pee Wee tournament when we played unbelievable. And the only run scored was in the first inning on a walk, a stolen base, stolen base and a wild pitch. Mm-hmm. And it still upsets me. Um, and I so you remember these things. Now imagine being in front of millions of people trying to win a major for the first time in 10 years, and you're in position, and you played great to get yourself there. Once again, you put yourself in position to win, and once again, it's heartbreak. And then people are like, oh, he should have, you didn't talk to media right afterwards, and you should have done that. And, and then he peeled off in the, the vehicle that he had afterwards. I'm going to say this. There's two, two things I want to say to the people that, that enjoy the... Uh, others agony you must have a sucky life yourself if you enjoy so much in other people's agony i feel sorry for you okay now i don't want to make this overly serious because i don't know roy roy mcelroy personally in golf he's making he's plenty rich okay he's got plenty of money but does money equal happiness let me tell you something. Roy McIlroy made a lot of money for finishing second yesterday. Did that look like a guy that was happy after no. he lost? Would you be happy if you lost? If you're an athlete of any type, I don't care if you're beer league softball, if you're an athlete of any type and you're competitive and you can't understand the disappointment and heartbreak that Roy McIlroy went through yesterday, and especially if you're a golfer, then you are heartless. Because these people in the media forget people are human. People that are watching these things on TV or seeing this stuff on social media forget about the human element. And, you know, the, the still shot of Rory watching DeChambeau make that putt, making a great, great up and down in a short putt. Because let's be honest, it didn't look like great for DeChambeau that he was going to get in with a par there, but he did. And... I mean, this is a guy that has been trying for so hard to win a major. He's had a lot of pressure on him since he was a little boy. He was a, he was a phenom. He was the he was the uh, he was Britain's great hope. I mean, he was Tiger Woods over there, mm-hmm. and he won a lot. He had a lot of success early in his career, and now even at his age, and he's had to deal with being a spokesperson and then being stabbed in the back by his own PGA Tour, standing up for what's right against Live Golf, and. He's been outspoken, and he's not been afraid to take some of these arrows. And he's worked so hard. And In fact, he, I read this the other day. He nearly got divorced. Him and his wife reconciled, and they're doing what's best for the family. So I think that helped him play on us this week. I wonder if there was a correlation. Like, mm-hmm. hey, you know, happy happy life off the course. That's good. And he was in position. He played great. And, and everything that he did to play so great is wiped away because he missed two putts. Mm-hmm. And as somebody pointed out, And I saw the highlight. Earlier in the round, he had an amazing shot from the fairway and got a horrible roll all the way off the green. If that stays on, that's at least a one-stroke, if a two-stroke difference. And golf is a game of inches just like any other sport when you're trying to win a championship, whether it's a championship as a team, whether you're trying to win it as an individual in tennis or or, wrestling or, or golf or whatever it might be. And... For people to go off on, well, he didn't talk to me right afterwards. Well, you know, I'm pretty sure that if you had your worst moment in your life, and I'm not saying that's Roy's worst moment, but if you had a bad moment in your life that was televised in front of millions of people, I'm just going to go out on a crazy limb here and say you wouldn't really run to the podium to answer questions yourself. Now, I understand Roy is a professional. That is part of the gig. I do get it. But I also understand the human element. I'm not going to hold anything against Rory because he didn't talk to the media. What do you think he's going to say? What do you want him to say? <laughs> he's going to say, I missed two putts. I should have made him. I didn't. It's very disappointing. And I really, it hurts right now. How do you feel, Rory? Yeah, That'd be the, the stupid ass question, question. Five times. Oh, yeah. He's going to give you the same answer. It'll be the same answer. Yeah. It'll be the stupid ass question. How does it feel, Rory? It feels great. I just lost the U.S. Open. It's amazing. You'll have some of the dumbest questions that even robots can come up with better questions. Some of the human beings that cover these sports things anymore. So there would be no feeling empathy for Roy McIlroy because people are all about trying to get a sound bite. They would try to get him upset or they would, they love the agony he's going through and that's just heartless. And we need more compassion in the world today. I mean, we need our leaders, the two people that are running to be president for the 18th time in a row, 
and we can't come up with two better freaking candidates for president than the two that we got. I mean, dear Lord, people, how messed up is this country? We can't come up with at least some fresh new candidates. Why do we have to keep recycling through the same damn candidates on both tickets? I'll stop there. But there's need. There, we need. We need compassion. And society would be a better place if we have less anger and more compassion and be a little bit more understandable of people's plights and, and problems in the world. But instead, we want to make fun. And by the way, we've had leaders that do this. And that's setting a horrible example for our children. And I'm talking leaders in sports, media, politics, okay? Can you just stop for a second and say, you know what, really, McElroy, I believe he is not a robot. And, oh, I know. Once again, I've said this a thousand times on the show. Look up the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. If you are vilifying and making fun of Roy McIlroy, I hope when something goes to hell in your life, Roy McIlroy comes right up to you and gives you a whole bunch of crap. And I hope Roy McIlroy goes ahead and asks you these questions like, how does it feel? Oh, you just lost your grandmother. How does it feel? You just got fired from your job. Hey, Dusty, <laughs> how does it feel? Do you think you'd want to answer those questions? You'd either give short answers or you'd fly off the handle. And you know what? I would be willing to bet you that Roy McIlroy, he's not stupid. Roy McIlroy was so devastated, and you can see it. He's so upset. He's so frustrated. He's hurting emotionally. And he knew that if he got in front of the podium and took questions, he would have said something he was going to regret. I think he knew that. The guy was pissed off, and he should be. He put himself in a position to win a major for the first time in a decade. He has a lot of pressure on him. That The pressure he puts on himself, the country puts on him, that people in America put on him. There's a ton of pressure on the guy. And and it's true of, there's a lot of pressure on Bryson DeChambeau too, but there's way more pressure on Roy McIlroy yesterday than Bryson DeChambeau. Roy McIlroy is trying to break a decade-long streak of winning a major. He's been mm-hmm. close so many freaking times. And here he put himself in position. And then it, once again, it ended in heartbreak. And if you keep having this go over, and, and you got to give Roy McIlroy some credit for putting himself in a situation to get back in a situation to be heartbroken again. There's a lot of athletes that would have already succumbed and lost and been done and retired and never been the same. Roy McIlroy might not be the same after this one. I hope he will be competing, and I hope it'll make it so sweet when he wins a major. If he wins another major, it'll be so sweet for Roy McIlroy. It will not erase all these losses. It will not erase what happened yesterday. But for people to give him so much crap about not talking to the media afterwards or, or spinning his tires, which wasn't that big a deal. Dear Lord, people exaggerate and put their things out of proportion. He didn't do a freaking kitty or a donut. He didn't run over anybody. He didn't carry a policeman on the side of his car like Scotty Schleffler. Okay? So, Roy McIlroy, I'm just sitting here saying, cut the guy some slack. If you've ever played golf and you've ever been in a tournament or a scramble or maybe it's just league golf and you're playing for some money, you're telling me you never miss a two and a half foot putt? And I bet you felt great about missing that putt, didn't you? That let your team down or yourself down? Come on, man. Come on, people. Be better than this. Our society sucks in so many ways, okay? With the people that are loud. Notice what I just said? Mm-hmm. The people that are loud. I think society in general isn't as bad as I or other people may make no, it out to not. be, but it is the sensationalism of the media entities out there. And then we've got all the social media garbage. And then we've got fans at a College World Series game for Texas A&M uh, disparaging Florida after that bat boy tragically died and referencing this in heckling and got thrown out last night at College World Series, which they deserved. This is how heartless people are. There is nothing that's off limits anymore. There's nothing that's off limits anymore. You think you can say, do whatever you want. And it's called human decency. And that's what the golden rule is all about. Treat others as you'd like to be treated. So if you're okay with making fun and mocking Roy Mackler for missing some putts, and if you're fun making, you enjoy making fun of him you know, squealing the tires a little bit when he left, and you want to take shots at him because he didn't get up in front of millions of people uh, uh, on TV on a press conference to answer stupid questions, um, if, 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 you don't, if, if you're cool with all that, then I want you to send me your phone number, your address, Okay, and I will try to get a media person to come to your house and interview you and and just follow you around with a camera. And then when something sucks in your life, I want you to do a press conference right then and there. And then I will try to get it on a webcast, a social media. I'm sure it'll be exhilarating. 
the amazing amount of restraint that athletes and even celebrities have Mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. And then when they don't have restraint, people jump all over these people. Now, the comeback is always this. I can treat these people any way I want because, one, they don't know who I am because I have a Twitter handle that you can't understand who it is because we wanna, we wouldn't want to have our name out there and stand behind our stupid comments. No, that would, be too, that would be too American if we did that. So we hide behind these things, and then we get mad because supposedly he hid from talking to the media. You chicken craps <laughs> out there hide behind your stuff on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram and all these other social media platforms. You hide behind all that, and then you criticize, and that's why you're the biggest hypocrite of all. You criticize a guy because he didn't step up to the plate and face the fire and the questions after, the, after a horrible loss in the U.S. Open. You don't even put your name on your freaking Twitter account and call yourself Wade Gerstner or Dusty Dynas on your Twitter account. You know? I mean, just put it out there. Anybody taking your name? Hopefully not. Why is that? Why do we have JKR1863PG exclamation point? Do we know who that is? No. But we know who Roy McIlroy is. And so I feel for Roy McIlroy. I feel for any golfer or any athlete that loses in such a horrible way. I felt horrible for the guy in uh and it was a it was a conference tournament this year where the kid thought that they were uh I I think he thought that they were tied or ahead or something and he held the ball and then they lost and they didn't qualify for the NCAA tournament. I felt horrible for that guy. People making fun of. I felt horrible. This kid probably had a great career, but that's what he's going to be remembered for. And I feel horrible, even if it's against my own team. I feel horrible when some high school kid, junior high kid, college kid, even a pro, uh, misses a free throw that would have won, tied the game with no time on the clock. Now, it might help my team win. Listen, I'm a big KU Jayhawk basketball fan. I have been my whole life. And, you know, Derek Rose missing free throw. I was exhilarated. I was excited because he missed it because it gave KU a chance to win and everything, right? Mm-hmm. But I also felt sorry for him because I'm like, that could easily have been my favorite player. That could easily have been me. Listen, I'm, I'm going to be willing to bet that every person listening to this show, you've choked in one way or another in your life. You've you gagged it. Oh, yeah. You know, you probably choked. I'm going to tell you right now, and, and I know I missed a free throw at least once in my life in a high school game where I just kind of, you know, let the noise in. I was a very good foul shooter, but I'm sure I missed a couple where I should have made them. Luckily, it didn't cost us a game that I recall. However, I remember in college in tennis, which is individual sports, singles. I played singles, tennis in college. And we were, I beat this guy uh, about a week prior in a duel. It was Bethany College against Bethel. And Bethel was our rival. And I beat the guy in straight sets. Close to 6-4, six, 6-4, four, six, four, I think it was. Two, it was best two out of three sets. 6-4, six, 6-4. Four, six, four. I was like the number five singles player on our team. You have, you have number one, two, three, four, five, six. So these points matter in duels. And they matter in your conference tournament. Okay? So I beat this guy. Brian Prillerman was his name. So if he's out there, anybody knows Brian Prillerman, you're going to shove this in my face in a moment. <laughs> So he, uh, I think he might have been from Conway Springs originally. I don't remember for sure. But anyway, he was playing Bethel. Bethel. And so I beat him in straight sets late in the season, and it was great. We beat him head-to-head, and we beat our rival, and it was important that I won that match. So we get the conference tournament. And I don't know where we were team-wise in winning the conference tournament. I don't think we were going to win it anyway. But I was playing, and I beat him in the first set. And the second set... I was up five to two. I'm pretty sure it was five two. And I choked. My serves because I was that close to winning mm-hmm. the match and I was going to be the champion of number five singles at the at the KCAC tennis meet. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's not the same as number one singles, but it's still something it's important. Still for you, yeah. Yeah. For, so for I have a for chance. Your journey. So, you know, I, I beat him a week prior. Tough match. I was ready to play. Played great the first set. Played great up five to two, second set. Played great. And my and my teammates are cheering them on and they were thinking, you know, this is just inevitable, right? And so then I and then guess what happened? I started thinking ahead a little bit. And then I uh, I lost I, I think I uh, didn't hold my serve. And now all of a sudden I started to I started to tense up a little bit. 
It's like, okay, instead of playing to win, I started to play not to lose. Mm -hmm. Next thing I know, it's 5-5. Now you're starting to freak out inside your head. Then you lose. I lost five straight games. I lost 7-5 in the second set. Now the match is even. Now we go a third set, and this this guy's got all the momentum, mm-hmm. and I and he knows I got I'm, he he knows I got some demons to battle, and I don't know how the third set went score wise, but he beat me. Mm-hmm. I never recovered. I never recovered. Now this was just a tennis meet, okay, at a lower college, and I was up five to two, and that's why I say the Celtics better be careful and don't blow it tonight, mm-hmm. and. I was an athlete in college. I was an athlete in high school. But even if you're not some great athlete or good athlete or decent athlete, sometime in your life, you've you probably played pool maybe or ping pong. And I bet you've choked the game. Did you feel good about it? If you're competitive, you didn't. If you have no competitive nature and you don't care about winning or losing, then you probably don't understand this as much. But if you have a competitive bone in your body, and I do, I don't like losing at anything. Mm. Now, I've learned as a parent to lose to my kids, sometimes on purpose. But I'm going to tell you something. Now, my son, oldest son is you know, 17, and we play, we play pickleball for ping pong, billiards. There's no mercy. I'm not letting him win anything. Not anymore. My youngest is 10. I still let him win some things, probably more than I should. But prior to having kids, I hated losing anything. I lose Connect Four, I'm pissed off. What? It's Connect Four. <laughs> I didn't like it. Uh, I lost it. If I lost in pitch and I made the wrong move or my partner put the wrong card, I wasn't too happy about it. Now, did I show it and slam the cards and run off? No, but I didn't like it. I'm not a big fan of losing. I don't like losing. Okay. Still don't at the age of 48. But I understand that you can't win all the time. Something I'm trying to teach my youngest is that you can't win all the time. So maybe I messed up as a parent letting him win more than I should have. And should have crushed his spirits when he was younger and beat him all the time. Don't know. Probably a happy medium. The point I'm trying to make is, if you've, if, you, if you've ever had a moment in your life where you failed at something, and you are making fun of Roy McIlroy or talking about how he's unprofessional by driving off and not talking to media, you need to take a stop, pump the brakes, look in the mirror, and think back to when you failed. And the old, the old, the old, the old castaway excuse is, he makes a lot of money. What, what, what does money got to do with choking? What does money got to do with losing a tennis match at Bethany College when I was had a chance to win the conference tournament? What's money got? To, what, 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 what does it matter what I have and my possessions are in the middle of competition? The other guy doesn't care how rich I am. He's playing me mm-hmm. one-on-one in tennis. Money, this is, that's the cop-out. Well, I can, I, can, I can ridicule somebody that I don't like. I can ridicule somebody I've never met. I can rip them. I can make fun of them. I can say horrible, nasty things about them. I can do that even to people that cost my team a victory. I've never met them. I can ridicule and make fun of the guy that goes to the NBA draft because selfishly I want him to play at KU. Don't understand the situation. He goes to the NBA draft and Johnny Furphy, but I'm going to make fun of him and belittle him because I want him back at KU, but then I'm going to cheer for him. What? <laughs> there are people out there like this. Oh, yeah, for sure. And it is deplorable. It is sick. It is gross. It is disgusting. And it's sad. And it's pathetic as hell. And this is what we have today. You know, did Roy McIlroy, did he lose the tournament? I go back to my original question. Did, did, was it DeChambeau winning it or Roy McIlroy losing it? And it's a combination of both. The Shambo made the shot. He had to make end. a hell of a shot. <laughs> he had to make a hell of a shot. Now, if Roy makes the two putts, that shot don't matter. Yeah. But sometimes you have a clutch play that happens for you. Sometimes you need luck. DeShambo mentioned it. He got lucky yesterday. Mm-hmm. He admits it. Absolutely, yeah. You know, the Royals yeah. were down 6-2 to two in the eighth inning of the ALDS in yeah. Houston. In the eighth inning, and a weird hop on a baseball. It could have been a double play. Goes in the outfield off Correa's glove. And next thing you know, floodgates open. And the Royals, that play's made. The Royals don't even get out of the ALDS. They lose in four. Instead, they go on to win that series in five. They beat the Blue Jays in six and win the World Series in five. Okay, that's the difference between winning and losing. Mm-hmm. Sometimes a spin of the ball, sometimes some bad luck, sometimes an umpire's call, a referee's call. Sometimes it's a putt that lips out of the cup. Sometimes it's a bad bounce when you hit the middle of the green like Roy did earlier. 
And then there are people that have no clue what athletics are or that level of athletics, but should understand that if they have any competitive bone in their body, that they should at least be able to have a little bit of empathy and go, wow, I really, it sucked to be Roy right now. Now, when you say that, are you worried about how much is in a bank account? No, no. because it shouldn't matter. The professional athletes, any athlete of any kind, the purpose of going out to play sports, especially I would say college and on, is it should be to win, to win, even in high school, to win. Now, does that mean that you had a horrible year if you didn't win a state title? No. Does it mean you had a horrible year, you went 10 and 10? No. But the goal of sports, this is why we keep score. Otherwise, why we keep score? Mm -hmm. The goal, the ultimate goal of sports is to win. And you try to win every time you participate in any sport. If I'm playing a card game, I'm trying to win. If I'm trying, if I'm, if Dusty and I play uh, Who Wants a Thumb War, blah, blah, blah. Remember that game? Mm -hmm. I want to win. I remember Jordan hated, I'm not telling myself Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan hated to lose. They've taught, it's documented. He hated to lose at anything. He'd get mad. That's what made him great. Because mm-hmm. he refused to lose, even though he did lose many times. He did, and Why do you think he had the guts to take the last second shot so many times? He didn't care. I mean, he cared, but he didn't freak out because he failed. He just came back and tried again. And that's what Roy will do. Roy will do that. That's the true consummate professional. Roy McIlroy will try again. How many of you out there are going to try again when bad things happen to you? Because some of you give up. Roy McIlroy, I'll bet you, will not give up. Will he ever get back in a spot where he has a chance to win a major again? I don't know. I can't predict the future. I think he will, but I think it's going to take some time to get over this one, no question. And what you want to ridicule the man who put everything in for four days. Played so great to get in that position. This is the thing that people always forget. He choked. He didn't. He choked. He played great for how many holes? He had two putts he did not make. He's going to remember those to the day he dies. You think it makes it any better for him? You want to make fun of him and act like you're better than him behind the moniker JK189 exclamation point dash point whatever your name is on Twitter? Congratulations. You're a great winner yourself. We've all failed. And now imagine if somebody was there following your every move when you fail, then expecting you to answer the questions after you miserably failed and using the word choke and making fun of you, how would you feel? (laughs) To use the reporter's old go-to question. How do you feel? How would you feel? So while I am excited for Bryson DeChambeau, pretty awesome on Father's Day. Well, I think he lost his father not too long ago. Um, I feel for Roy McIlroy. And, and as much as I cheer for a particular team, I do usually have empathy for the team that loses. You know, every championship moment, no matter what the sport is, what do the cameras do? They capture the joy and exuberance Mm -hmm. of winning a title, right? And they catch the heartbreak of losing. That's what we saw yesterday. That was great drama. Oh, yeah. But we had to have a happy ending for one person and a bad ending for the other. And Roy Roy McIlroy is not a villain. He's not a villain. He's highly respected. Um, And so I, I feel for him... And yes, I understand having some fun, you know, here and there. I'm not saying you can't have some fun on social media. Don't I'm not don't get me that far. But for the people that just don't understand, they've lost track of what it, being a human being is. That's what these people have done on social media and in in the media themselves. There are media people that have asked some really bad questions, and some have had to apologize later, going, "You know, I just lost track, got caught up in doing my job and getting a quote." There's a, some no, of yeah, that admitted sure. that. Yeah, it's like. Y- y- it's it's time it's a gut check time let's be better and i know we won't be that's mm-hmm. the sad thing it'll only get worse but i feel for a macro i really truly do yeah it's a discussion that that like goes beyond like what i mean you're listening to it and, and you're giving your experiences that you had in tennis right as as kind of an example of you were you were there in the driver's seat and, and then it fell apart for you right and and so how how would 
You, and I don't, I don't how, feel like that guy played better to beat me. I feel yeah, exactly. like I let him, I yeah. didn't let him win, but I feel like I beat myself. Yeah, and then on the other side, you know, by the time you feel like you beat yourself was which when was when you lost seven to five, right? right. And then your your third set, most people are going to say now at this point he still has a chance to win. No, I was already beaten. Yeah, but he knows that you've been beaten yes. because he's on that side. But the people that don't are not in your brain mm-hmm. are saying he still has a chance to win. Sure. So this guy won, right? He took it and and took the the advantage that he had by coming back to beat you and took advantage of that and went in and won the third set. It's just what you're saying, right? It's a little bit of both. Yes. Because in your mind, obviously it's not. You feel you choked it, right? Yes. But on the on my side, it's like there's a whole nother set that this guy over here has to win to right. win the match, right. right? And so he's still gotta do some things right here. Whether he feels like his opponent is beaten or not, he's still gotta go perform. Yeah. And so I think in all all these situations and and when i'm talking about this i'm like i don't even want to talk about this in in a in a sports sense because anytime you're like at your down point like using myself as an example if i'm sitting in the hospital for two months and you're sitting here making fun of me how do you think that's going to make me feel exactly. right like i'm out this is i'm down and out right now yeah. and whether i'm down and out for 30 seconds or I'm down and out for three hours or I'm down and out for two months. I don't care what that situation is. I think what you're talking about the most is empathy and yes. like have some of that for people. It's not that hard to do. If you don't like something or if you, if you just like have this so much disdain for a person or a team or an individual or whatever it is that that's where you resort then i can't help you first of all yeah. and second of all it's like move on just go right past it like why do you that's that's the why social, does it matter to social you? media thing. today and i you know you're talking about a lot of this stuff and and the biggest thing that always comes to my mind is especially on twitter because facebook's actually trying to regulate and make sure people have their names on their profiles and stuff like that so they do way better of a job of doing that than twitter does or x now x is getting it's getting i think it's getting worse in that yeah. realm actually of people that, that can just put a name on something put their put a profile picture and there's a community that I'm, I'm kind of in on a different Twitter account because I don't want to really involve it in all my day-to-day stuff. Right. But because I know that there's just some people that aren't interested in scary movies. We'll just put it that way, right? Okay, sure. And so I do – I kind of have a different account that I just interact with some other scary movie fans, right, on Twitter. And, and so it's like there's a – a sect of that group that is doing this right now with one particular actress's profile picture and a fake name and they're just just railing on everybody else in the fandom and it's like i don't even know what your name is i don't know who you are it's an immediate block for me right yeah and so it's like we don't know these people and that's what's bad about social media right now is empathy's been lost because of social media yeah. in a lot of areas yes and so it is. It's just like I, I saw one of the girls that I follow complaining this morning that people are making fun of the way she looks in a picture she posted. It's like scroll past it. You're making fun of Rory because he's mad. He just lost one of the biggest tournaments of his career. He's trying to win a major for the first time in 10 years. If you don't like the way he acted, scroll past yes, it. Yes, go to something else. Just move on with your life. And so it, that's for me is the empathy's not there. I Listen, I... I'm not saying I don't like to have fun with like some teams that I don't like sure. and they lose and the, like the Patriots would be a good example. Listen, I don't go as far as a lot of K State fans do, but do I get a little sense of like okay, you just lost in the tournament? Sure, I'm not mad about it, <laughs> right, right, right. But I don't go on and just like rail on all the KU fans and just bring them down because their team just lost. Right. I will tell you right now, I have it's it's a lot easier for me to have empathy for a, an individual like Rory McIlroy because he doesn't have like that big group of fandom that just gets under your skin, right? And he like, can't blame fans, anybody yeah, else. Exactly, you have to it's, take it's it. on him. So it's and, and that's the way tennis is too. And listen, when I was playing tennis, like you're talking about singles, I played doubles and and when, in high school, the place that people feared me was at the net because I, my ground strokes were average at best, right? Mm-hmm. But when I was at the net, that's where my the opponents feared me. How aggravating is it when I'm going for an overhead and it goes right into the net? Or if I'm going for an overhead, I misplace hand-eye coordination and I bomb it three feet out of bounds. And it's like some of those mistakes that you make individually, even if you're on a doubles team, can haunt you for the rest of that match if you don't refocus yourself. Yes. And so people if you've ever been in that position just understand being in that position yeah and move on with it you know i had a, i had a freshman year basketball 
we we're playing Nest City. There's four seconds left. All the girls in my class, we just had a, our point guard had quit for I don't know what reason. He was mad at the coach, I think. Right before the last game of the year, all the girls in our class said, you can't win without Adriel on your team. And so we're down two with four or five seconds left. I've got the ball at the wing. This is a freshman game, like you said. Yours is number five singles, but this is a freshman game for me. We had a lot of kids in school back then. None of our kids were on varsity as as freshmen when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And so this was our team. This was where the moment was for our class. And I have a three-pointer wide open on the wing with four seconds left I, I don't need the shot but i can win the game with the shot and it's wide open so i take it yes it rolls halfway down pops out my buddy gets the rebound on the right block all he's got to do is put it back up and then we're tied going to overtime yep he thought we needed a three yep. he turns throws it back out to me to the wing to my classmate don't get a, another three off in time we lose the game for me i felt like i lost the game i took a shot that i missed yeah, but Mark's feeling like he lost the game because right. he didn't realize we just needed a two. Right, but we're not making fun of each other. We're not no. mad at each other. We're we're mad we lost the game because we really, really, really wanted to win that one without the guy that was well, our leading scorer. And so those things they always they stay yeah. with you what with you, what you're talking about. And it's like just understand when, that what, we're down right now. Exactly, there's the point. <laughs> you're down, and so when and and now imagine and I haven't taken it to the next level. So now imagine. You have a horrible moment in your life professionally like Roy did yesterday at the end. Yeah. You can't turn on TV. You can't you can't go no. look at your Twitter account or Facebook. There'll be all stuff making all fun over. of you. Yeah. You can't avoid it. The only way you avoid it is you just go and you, you go join Aaron Rodgers in a dark place, right? Yeah. So so what you need, and this applies, and this is the thing that people don't understand. Some people. This, hang with me here. When you're in the hospital bed and you could barely move. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I lost a tennis match, I'm talking about. Um, if you're Roy McIlroy and you lose in heartbreaking fashion like that, or you do something, you made a mistake in your life, and you went to jail or something for a day, but people know about it, right? Because your small town community, you're going to know, or word gets out nowadays. You can't erase any of it. No. You can't erase any of it. But what do you need in all those circumstances where you're heartbroken because you made a mistake? You're heartbroken because you don't have your health. You're heartbroken because you didn't win a golf tournament. Or you're heartbroken because um, this or that. What do you need around you? You need support and people that can lift you up. Bingo. Social media is not very good at lifting anybody up. And so my advice to many people out there is that if you're not doing so great, either if you are somehow going to be on social media, start blocking a whole bunch of people that aren't positive, that are not supporting, are supportive. You need to get away from this negative negativity that those people provide. If you can stay off social media, especially when you're down, that might be good. Now, you might come across something on social media that really lifts you up. I, I don't want to sit here and say all social media no, is bad because it's not. Because I did get a lot of lift right. up in the hospital from Facebook. Exactly. There's no question about that. But here's the thing. you got to be careful. Not you, you need to focus on and try to surround yourself the best you can within your own control of people that will support you and lift you up. And if you don't have that, then it's going to be really hard to bounce back. No matter what, yeah. whether you're in the hospital, whether you're in jail, whether you missed a couple putts in the, in the U.S. Open yesterday. And Roy McIlroy has had this heartbreak many times before. And now can you imagine when you've been so close so many times, you keep losing in heartbreaking fashion, and this one worse than the previous ones, which you thought were the worst at the time? That's got to be unbelievably frustrating. And a lot of people out there just don't understand that. So the key is when things aren't going well – is to try to hopefully, hopefully you have a good support system. They can rally around you, but also you can be around them. Maybe even seek out people. If they're not seeking out to support you, it doesn't mean they don't support you, but maybe they're a little bit careful. They don't want to step on your toes and you need to seek them out for support. But that's what people need when they face adversity or when they're facing a tough time, whether it's a sport like golf yesterday, whether it's a hospital that Dusty was in, whether it was me uh, driving for my son who almost died Absolutely. when he was born. 
all and if he lose a tennis match you know what my teammates were there to support me didn't make me feel much better i'm not gonna lie but probably helped speed up the but process yeah, you don't of know getting over it. in the moment how much that actually did help right. you, you don't, right not like, at the moment. Uh, it was the same thing I, just that that shot that i'm using as yeah. an example i'm trying to tell mark it's not his fault he's right. telling me it's not my fault right if it, but we're not listening to each other in the moment right but it it You'll understand. Right. It might be a, an hour later. It might be three days later. Be like, oh, dude, thanks for lifting me up, man. Like, yeah. You were there for me, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a bit to understand that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just remember, we're all human, including people you watch on TV. They're human. Yeah. They're not <laughs> robots, contrary to what you might think. <laughs> uh, so anyway, a little deep here on the sports ticket. Dusty went to a wedding. It was not his. You went no. to a wedding. Parker got married. Poor girl. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? God bless no, Carly. <laughs> no. She's, 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 she, yeah, I don't, yeah. God bless who's married to Riley. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, it's too easy. Too easy. I have the platform here. I can use it. Okay. We're just joking. All right. They're not going to be too offended by any of that stuff. But uh, Parker and Riley are now both married. Parker got married over the weekend and you got to. Uh, witness a wedding and have a good time and not yeah. get much sleep. So no, yeah, it was <laughs> <laughs> no I don't sleep know. and yeah, it was it was a it was a quick weekend but a long weekend yes. at the same time. Yes. Um, but a blessing to be there without question. Very cool. Uh, I took my family. We went uh, just a, a short little vacation, about three or four days. I, I say short because usually people will take a full week. Mm-hmm. We took about four days, but we drove down to uh, Arkansas to. Uh, uh, Washita, Lake Washita. Never been down there. Never been to Arkansas. And uh, interesting area and, mm-hmm. and the forest down there and everything. National Park. And, and we got to do a lot of fun things. Had a boat for a day and had a blast out there. And we got a boat with had a slide. You slide into the lake and, and then you could jump off the top of the boat. It had mm-hmm. a platform up high to jump off. So even me, that's not <laughs> a great swimmer, had a life jacket. So that was cool. But I did lots of things I hadn't done before. That was a lot of fun. You're never too, you're only as old as you feel and you're never too young to do things, I guess. If physically able, you might not be able to if you're not mm-hmm. physically able. But, but had a lot of fun with the kids. They all had a good time. It's hard to find something that, that you're 17, you're 15, and you're 10-year-old and your wife and you all want to do at the same time. That's a very challenging task. But you know, being on the lake is one of those ways of having a lot of fun. So we had a blast and we did a lot of other different things too. But I will say, chiggers live. <laughs> I mean, chiggers are the worst. Arkansas, we went a little mini hike by the place we were staying. I mean, it was a mini hike just to go see the lake a little bit. And I still got chigger bites. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I mean, and then you start scratching them and then you start looking like you have chicken pox or whatever else, heat rash and like, what the heck happened to you? Uh, and I, I got attacked by chiggers. And you can't see those. Suckers. That's the thing is you, you can't, can't see, see the them. Dang that's, things. What su- that's what sucks. At but you least can't God see made mosquitoes yeah, you big enough for me them. to see and right. I can get them off of yeah, me. But when the chiggers are biting you, you can't no. see them. And, yeah, and it's bad in, in grassy areas. Yes. And then, I mean, wheat harvest. I can't even tell oh. you how many times I had chigger bites just oh. everywhere. Like, what? how did this happen? Yeah. So that was <laughs> a bad thing about Arkansas where we're at. We got, we got hit by chiggers pretty bad there. Um, and, and so we got the proof, all our bodies have the proof of that. (laughs) There's no doubt about it. Uh, but we had a good time. And so that's the important thing is you had a great time, uh, watching relation and friends and uh, of course get married. And, uh, I had a chance to spend time with the family on vacation and I didn't dwell too much about what's happening to professional athletes or other people's failures. And I was hardly ever on social media during this time I was away, <laughs> which honestly, I, I do feel lighter, oh, it, lighter it, when no I'm doubt. not on. Yeah. I, I tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll challenge people. And I think there, this would be some cool challenge that you remember, remember the, uh, uh, the water bucket challenge mm-hmm. for ALS. Yeah. And there's all kinds of challenges. TikTok has all kinds of, some of them really bad challenges. Mm-hmm. How about this one? And maybe it's out there and I haven't heard about it. How about we have a challenge where no social media for 24 hours or just turn your phone off for 24 hours? Yeah. One of the best three-day stretches of my it's, life happened about five years ago when my phone went kapot 
and I had to yeah. wait for a replacement for three days. And you can't believe how much how less stressed I was. I thought it'd be horrible. I was like, oh my god, I'm going to miss out. I'm going to I'm not going to know this. I'm not going to know that. I need to do this for work and whatever else and blah blah blah. You know what? There is different ways for me to get the information. I could still go on a computer and grab the email instead of having it right on my phone, and I could actually make a phone call instead of having to you know text or do this. And it was like, wow, I'm not getting bothered all the time with notifications. Yeah. I'm not getting bothered by people texting me left and right. Uh, I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. So maybe we should start that challenge. Everybody in America for one day, turn off your phones. The world fall apart, wouldn't it? Yeah. Back when I was going to muscular dystrophy camp, you, they would take your phones at the beginning of the yep. – uh, when the kids got there. They would take your phones at the beginning when kids got there all the way through. You could check them at night just in case there might have been an emergency or something. Yeah. But, man, when I checked that phone in, I'm be like, you can have it. Yes. I don't even want it this week. Yes. <laughs> it's all yours. The, you could, you, the limit for uh, – or the youngest a counselor could be was 16. So you see these like 16 year old boys and girls, they're like, you can't take my phone. That's my life. <laughs> and I'm like, nah, keep it for the week. I don't even want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the only year I actually wanted it was when the Spurs, well, two years the Spurs were playing the Heat in the finals. And yeah. I actually just wanted to check the scores. That's the only time I ever even wanted my phone during yeah. those weeks. It is, it is uh, nice to just not worry about that. And there, I think I do want to say to you, like, in, in, whatever profession you're in god you just sometimes just just leave it leave it alone just put it somewhere yeah. don't even think about it yeah. i was not thinking about sports this weekend i've it, as i've gotten older I've, I've understood that you know i do have a job yeah and and i want to know what i'm talking about when i come in for the sports ticket or if i right. do my sports cast but there's also a point where i can learn some stuff based on the internet that i did not watch and see yes and and i've i've put myself in in the spot where like it's like just put this thing away yeah. for, and some days it'll be for 12 hours. Some days it'll only be for two. Um, sometimes if I'm watching a movie and I want to focus, I just shut the phone off because I'm like, I cannot focus if that is next to me and on. Yeah. And so that's something that I've done as I've gotten older is like, it's, it'll be there yeah. when I turn it back on that's and right. it is what it is at the moment in time. Like I've, I did, I did not pay attention to sports at all until about last yeah. night at five o'clock. That's not a bad thing. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. So I end the show with this. It was our good news of the day. And it, and I think this is really a cool idea. And I think it should catch on. And I almost think I'm going to have to tell everybody when I die, this is what I want my f- thing to be as well. Wow, we're talking about dying. That's so morbid. But listen to this good news. And this is and when I read the headline, and this is once again, it helps to read the story, people. When I read the headline, I figured this was an old guy that passed away, Mm -hmm. that for years it said he wanted this big celebration of his life. Not the case. Listen to this. An Arizona woman held a fun roll. Not a funeral. A fun roll. You get it? F-U-N? Fun roll. An Arizona woman held a fun roll to celebrate her late husband's life, complete with a bouncy castle, his favorite food, and party bags for guests to take home among the many good vibes. Katie Young suddenly lost her husband, Brandon, after he suffered a stroke at the age of 39, and he passed away a few weeks later on May 17th. The couple had three children together, and Katie didn't want them to have horrible memories of their dad's send-off. I was thinking about my children and how the day would be, and it felt so wrong. All we were going to do was have these horrible memories. It didn't feel true to Brandon. Instead of holding a traditional service and wake, the 40-year-old widow set out to make it a fun roll. Ensuring the day would be a celebration of Brandon's life for her kids, ages 8 through 12, and the hundreds of guests. She featured his favorite foods, chips and dip, and displayed his artwork and vast record collection so everyone could take home a goodie bag of items that would keep his memory alive. Crafting tables were even set up for people to make their own art. Every time I started thinking about planning a traditional funeral, I did not want to do it, said the widow. She became adamant about holding a celebration that her husband of 16 years would have enjoyed. I have so many happy memories of Brandon. We loved to cook together. He taught me to have fun in the kitchen. I would follow a recipe. He would make things up. She said she knew the day was perfect when she looked over at their children during the funeral, and they all had smiles on their faces. They will only have the happiest mem- memories from their dad's funeral instead of it being traumatic. Brandon loved being a dad more than anything on earth. He would have been happy that his kids were happy. Maybe this is something that needs to catch on. Maybe it's something that we need to do. You know, it's okay to... I think everybody feels like they feel guilty if they're celebrating somebody that died. But actually, it makes more sense to celebrate their life instead of feeling sorry for yourself all the time. And it and that's just the way we're wired, right? That's how we've done it in society for so many years. It's like, you have a funeral, you're supposed to wear black, you're supposed to be sad. 
And then sometimes when somebody's lived a long, prosperous life, you're sad, but you understand, wow, they had a long life, you know? And somebody passed away when they're young, it's even more sad, right? But this is a pretty cool concept. So when I read the headline, I figured it was like a 95-year-old grandfather. Mm -hmm. No, he was a 39-year-old man, father of three. His widow's 40. He died of a stroke suddenly. So he probably, who knows how detailed a will, if he even had a will, I don't Mm -hmm. know. And it's like this mom, give her a ton of credit, being strong enough to set aside her own emotions and do what she thought was best for her kids and then for people to remember him. And everybody had a great time. And she knows her husband looking down below would be proud of what she did. I've had a situation in my life where I did something and my family didn't like it. But I knew the person that passed away would have been okay with it. And that's why I was okay with Mm -hmm. it. And I was like, so you're going to judge me and be mad at me for not telling me what you wanted me to do, but I'm supposed to read your mind. But I'm sorry, the day of the funeral, I wasn't thinking of you. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of my grandpa who died. Now, that doesn't mean I don't love everybody else. It's just for that day, I kind of wanted to focus on my grandpa. Mm -hmm. And so that was my focus. And so there was something that I didn't attend. And I knew that my grandpa would have been okay with it. But I rubbed some people the wrong way because of my decision. But you know what? I can die tomorrow knowing that the person I was there to honor, I am a thousand percent sure he would have been okay with it. And that's the tough thing in life. There are probably some people that are like the audacious woman to have a funeral. What's wrong with her? I'm sure people judged her. I'm sure people have said some things behind her back. You know what? The hell with those people. Do what you think is best. That's what I did that day, and that's what this lady did. Yeah. And I think there is there is importance in empowerment. Making your own decisions, we all have to live with them, and everybody's going to judge you. And no matter what you do, somebody out there will judge you harshly. No matter if you do something great, somebody will have a way to nitpick. They're just negative. Once they would go to negativity, right? But this lady, I give her a ton of credit. Maybe there's something that could catch on. A fun role. I, well, and uh, listen, I heard you talking about this coming in for the good news of the day. And I was like, hey, I, I, I'm, I get just a little bit of time. I've actually been a part of one of these. Have you really? Yeah. Cool. I didn't know. It's not the same, exact same as this. Mm-hmm. But so my Aunt Marianne passed away um, 2020, 2019, I believe, actually. She was 66. And prior, like a year prior to that, kind of a similar situation. She had had a stroke, right? Mm-hmm. And then... She was kind of getting better a little bit. Then she took a turn, had another stroke. About a year later, she passed away. And she was 66. So it's, she was older than this person, obviously, but also not. It was a situation where we were not expecting her to have a stroke and go, right? right. And so, and for that to be the rest of her path in life. But uh, she was Catholic. So we did the normal, you know, you do the Catholic mass, the service, and mm-hmm. then the burial, right? But the moment we left that cemetery, there was not much more sadness because. My cousin and Aunt Marianne, her mom, were always known if if they were hosting our side of the family for any kind of reunion or anything, they were known for putting the party together, right? And so it was always there at the parish hall there uh, at St. Mary's in Salina, and, and they, that's where they had parties, and they, mm-hmm. they planned them together. My uncle probably didn't like footing the bill for all of them, but uh, they, they planned them all together, and for her for her uh, celebration, it was it was a party that... that Trina put together and you know I it, it at the time it's it's kind of like this is an interesting way to go about this right there's like an ice cream bar there's like you know yeah. g- great food and there was like a little bit of a party favor for everybody but then th- she was uh, her daughter Trina was passing out like all of her jewelry Aunt Marianne had so much jewelry oh, yeah. so she was giving it to you know friends nieces uh, sisters-in-law aunts cousins whatever it might be right and just giving away the 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 jewelry so they could have a piece of Aunt Marianne too. And listen, I, at the time, again, it was kind of different going to so many Catholic funerals where that's more of a morose, you know, you're just like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to share my memories, but I'm not going to be too happy here because it just doesn't feel right to be happy right now. It's almost like you're trying to make sure you act the way other people think you should act. But then like once you got into the day and understood what was actually going on here, listen, do you think I remember that? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Do you think I remember details of many of the funeral dinners that I've been at? 
I don't. No. I remember we ate. I remember I talked with my family. But do I remember like this certain point of that? I don't. But I'll never forget that day. And so it, it was. It was just. It was a celebration. It was not. And, and Trina said that right away. She's like, "We're not here to cry anymore." <laughs> yes. And so it was like it was. It was a unique way to do it. But it was something I'll never forget, and, and I'll definitely remember it. So, it, I, I, when you're reading that, I was like, "That's that was what Aunt Mary Ann's." That was what it was like. Was. It was just. It was a party. Yeah, I think I'm gonna copy that story, yeah. and post it on social media, and tag some people because I, you know, yeah. I mean, you, you're gonna have your enough. You're gonna have enough sadness, and it's gonna yeah. hit you that you do. You do. Do you need a full day of it when you're gonna? I mean, you know, you're there to support. Even if you're celebrating somebody's life instead of crying about them losing their life or passing on, and and everybody handles trauma and grief differently there's yeah. no i always always enjoy when people try to tell me how to i'm supposed to grieve like you what the hell i don't care if there's a book it doesn't matter we're all different people i'll grieve the way i need to grieve okay and if yeah. you have a problem with it then okay you're not really that supportive and whatever and i'll try i'll respect you grieving the way you need to grieve some people hold it in for a long time you're eventually going to grieve even if you have a fun role you're or yeah. you will you'll or you celebrate, then you grieve. You'll have your moments, obviously. Uh, but it's an interesting concept. Very interesting yeah, concept. for sure. 1033 the time, 83 degrees on a Monday. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. State, regional, and national sports talk on your schedule. The Sports Ticket Podcast. Subscribe via Apple, Google, and TuneIn Podcasts or sunflowerstateradio.com.